amazing how without any communication our Sunday school lesson this morning is leading us right into the message as well as the music that Allison and Christy selected. We find ourselves coming to the end of the season of Pentecost. And it's during this season in our church year that we're called to examine our discipleship. You know, we have Advent, in which we're waiting on Christ to be born, and the ramifications of waiting on the Messiah, and what the Advent in our life is. And then we have the season of Christmas and the season of Epiphany. We move right into the season of Lent. And we go right into the season of Easter. And then that long stretch where we see lots of green is all about discipleship. It's all about what Jesus Christ has taught us to do in his calling on us as disciples to model our lives after. I think he was pretty smart in knowing that it took us longer to figure out how to be disciples than it is to learn how to wait on him or to celebrate his birth or to go through a season of repentance. But during this time that we're called to examine our discipleship, we're trying to figure out if we're on the right path. Are we following the path that Jesus Christ is leading us to? The season after Pentecost is meant to be a time of soul searching in which we ask ourselves, are we dedicated and maturing disciples? Or we found ourselves in some sort of holding pattern like an American Airways plane on the tarmac waiting three hours. Are we just ready to throw up our hands and call it quits? Is it just too hard? Is Jesus just asked too much out of us? Almost all the New Testament passages during the season of Pentecost that are selected have Jesus teaching or interacting with his disciples. And this morning's lesson is no different. It's Jesus interacting with a man who comes to him. It's a very familiar story for many of us. Have a young man that comes to Jesus. He's in a hurry. Jesus is in a hurry, but he stops him in the street and he says, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Listen to the way Eugene Peterson tells the story in the message. This is from Mark 10, beginning with verse 17. And this is taken from the message this morning. As Jesus went out into the street, a man came running up, greeted him with great reverence, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? Jesus said, Why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God. And he went on to say, You know the commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat. Honor your father and mother. And the man said, Teacher, I have from all my youth kept every single one of them. He said, There's one thing left. And Jesus looked him hard in the eye and loved him. Jesus said, There's one thing left. Go sell whatever you have and give it to the poor. All your wealth will then be heavenly wealth. And then, come follow me. The man's face clouded over. This was the last thing he expected to hear. And he walked off with a heavy heart. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not about to let go. Looking at his disciples, Jesus said, do you have any idea how difficult it is for people who have it all to enter into God's kingdom? The disciples couldn't believe what they were hearing, but Jesus kept on. You can't imagine how difficult. 
I'd say it's easier for a camel to go through the needle's eye than for the rich to get into God's kingdom. That set the disciples back on their heels. Then who has any chance at all, they asked. Jesus was blunt. No chance at all if you think you can pull it off by yourself. Every chance in the world if you let God do it. This is the word of God and it can be trusted. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> At a wilderness area in a Colorado State Park, <clears throat> visitors who go on the hiking trails or stay in the primitive campground are given comment cards and asked to fill them out. And some of the comments that were submitted are, the trails need to be reconstructed so they aren't all going uphill. <laughs> Another one said, well, there are too many bugs. Could you have the area sprayed to get rid of all the pests? Still another one said, well, the coyotes were too loud last night. Please eliminate these annoying animals. <laughs> another one said, a deer came into our camp and ate our bread and peanut butter. Would you please reimburse us for our loss? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and the one that caught my attention was one that said, a Starbucks at the top of the trailhead would be nice. <laughs> These comments and complaints were obviously made by people who did not really understand what it means to be in a wilderness area and what that involves. They were looking for something convenient, comfortable, and that does not come in the territory of a wilderness area. Similarly, I think a lot of people who claim to be a disciple or a follower of Christ don't truly understand what that involves either. Today's lesson, contrary to what many preachers would say, is not just about money and possessions. It's not about wealth, but it's about God calling us to be totally surrendered to Him. It's a call to us to yield control of our lives and to willingly give that control to Him. The man in today's passage is not given a name, but we're told in other gospel accounts in Matthew and Luke that he was very wealthy, he was young, that he was powerful, and over the years has become identified simply as the rich young ruler. It's likely that he had heard Jesus had something available that he didn't have, and that was eternal life. And being the rich young man with a lot of influence that he was, he wanted in on that. There was finally something within his purview that he didn't have, and he wanted some of it. He had everything else, so why not this eternal life thing? I wonder if he came to Jesus seeking what his money couldn't buy and what his power and influence could not get him. I think he was a young man that was quite used to getting everything he wanted. Back on my side of the tracks, we call those people spoiled brats. <laughs> but I don't know that. What we can tell from the passage is that he was a moral, good, law-abiding man. But I think he came to Jesus with this preconceived idea that he could get what he wanted and then go on about his merry way, living his life as usual. I can almost read between the lines and hear this young man saying, Okay, let's cut to the chase. Let's get right to the bottom line now. What do I need to do to get what I want? Give me what I came after. And just let me go on about my way and live my life the way I want to live my life. Yakov Smirnov, I think he's one of the funniest comedians around, said that when he first came to the United States, he was absolutely amazed at the variety of instant products that he found on the shelves at the grocery store. He said, I went in and there was powdered milk. You add water and boom, you have milk. 
He said, then I found powdered orange juice. You add water and boom, you have orange juice. And then he said, I saw some baby powder. And I thought to myself, what a country. <laughs> some things are just not that easy. And true followers of Jesus recognize this. Jesus wanted this rich, powerful, totally self-sufficient young man to become completely <clears throat> dependent upon him. And you know, sometimes Jesus has to take us down a peg or two to get us right. to depend on him. Jesus was calling this man that he looked straight in the eye with an eye of love and was calling him to be a disciple. If he had trusted in what Jesus was telling him, he would have discovered very quickly that Jesus truly was his security, his hope, and his future. In this instance, Jesus knew that this man's money and his power and his influence were the exact things that kept him from believing and trusting and becoming a follower. But what about us? <coughs> I don't think any of us here this morning are very wealthy. <coughs> if you are, please see me after the service. <laughs> None of us here wield great power or influence, do we? Again, if you do, see me after the service. <laughs> But there are things in our lives that keep us from trusting Jesus completely. Let's allow ourselves to be this man that came up to Jesus for just a minute. We come to Jesus and we want what he's offering. We want eternal life. We want peace. We want purpose. We want hope. And Jesus looks us straight in the eye with that look of love that only he has. And he tells us, that to have what he is offering, we must give up and fill in the blank. Our pride, our prejudices, our biases, our codependence, our self-reliance, our safety, our security, or whatever stands between us and fully trusting in Him to meet our needs as His follower. There's some of us that harbor bitterness and resentment, and we just won't let it go because that's our security blanket. Others won't let go of our grudges or some internal anger that we have with another person. Still others of us refuse to do away with our own judgmental spirit and our own self-righteousness. We wear it like a cloak of honor. It doesn't have to be material things that keep us from following Jesus as a disciple. Anything that takes precedence over his control is a barrier to our true discipleship. Sometimes I think we're too hard on this guy and we're too easy on ourselves. We hear this story and we think, what a fool. He just doesn't get it, does he? If, it's all about trust. All he has to do is trust Jesus. And he just can't trust and he loses eternal life because he doesn't trust. Would we do it? If Jesus came to us right now. Would we be prepared to follow Jesus like this man was called to do? Give up something that's very important in your life. Follow me. Are we willing to surrender the things that we have been banking on for our happiness or our security? We let them go. <coughs> Follow Jesus. In essence, Jesus is calling this guy to trust him completely. And we're human. And probably. Everyone sitting in this room has some trust issues of some sort because we've been burned. 